Keith, welcome to the podcast. Now, let's go back in time a little bit. We like to see what's shaped our guests. You were born South End on Sea in 1956. Who was Keith as a youngster? Take us through those those early years. Bit of an adventurous hooligan, I think, would have been the thing there. This seems really weird. Someone asking me the questions. After, it's usually <laughs> the other way around, especially after all this time. I like um, it. I mean, I had a pretty standard Essex kind of a, an upbringing, I suppose. My dad was a rascal. My mum was a was a, a saint. Um, I was born in a house, not in a hospital, in Westcliff on Sea. Um, we moved up the road um, to a place called Rochford. I went to Hawkwell Holt School, primary school. I think it's still there. King Edmund Comprehensive School, which was a school full of about 1,100 kids back in the day. The demographic, you know, compared with today is is amazingly different. Um, but what, uh, what was the kind of kid was I, like I said, adventurous, we had a, the area, of course, you've got the seafront of South End, which is as it is still now, pretty much. Yep. I don't think it's much changed to be honest. It's still as down market as it was back then. Um, but you had such a vast amount of things that you could get on and do as a youngster trails. We had, a, a, just half a mile from the back of my house in Ashington, as it turned out, that's where we moved to in the end, Ashington, there was a, a place we called the Brickies, the Brickfields, and it was an old quarry. And you could ride motorbikes around there and do whatever you like. There's a scrapyard on site as well that you could, back in the day, no health and safety, you could wander in, climb over piles of old cars and sort out what you wanted to do, make motorbikes out of them, make cars out of them. We are all driving and riding something at sort of 10, 11, 12 years old back in the day. It was crazy, really, when I think back on it now, because I'd never let my kids bloody get away with anything like that nowadays. We're different so time, though, Keith, isn't it? Different time. D- completely different times. I mean, completely different times. You went out of the house first thing in the morning and didn't come back till way after dark. No one was mm. looking after you. I mean, I nearly drowned in the brick fields as it happened because the, the, the old quarry used to fill with water and I couldn't swim. And I remember falling in and all I could remember was flicking my feet on the bottom when I and keep coming up for some air. <laughs> and my mate, mate's holding a big stick out to try and pull me out of the place. And every time I grabbed the stick to be pulled out, they let go of it. And I just took another belly full of bloody um, dirty water on board. And it was just, you know, you'd go out and you'd catch snakes. You'd go out and catch, you know, lizards and stuff like that that used to be prevalent back in the day then. Um, it, it was that kind of upbringing. And the first time I rode my bike was when I was probably about 10 years old in the back garden, a small back garden. It sounds like a big back garden compared with ours nowadays, Tim, as we've moved on. Um, and it was Ray and Paulie White um, that, that had a, a, a motorbike that we used to ride around their back garden. That was the first one I ever rode. Um, and of course, on a push bike, I was always the fastest kid on a push bike. I was always somehow the fastest kid. And that moved on to, like I say, riding around the brick fields. And there was a fella called Johnny Ingerfield um, that I was at school with. And, and he had a, a big old 500cc Triumph. I think it was a Tribzer, a Triumph, you know, a 500 Triumph engine in a, in a BSA frame from memory. And the first time I rode it, I remember he lent me it for a, for a couple of laps and, and and I came back and stopped at the edge and everyone was going, oh, you're going to bloody kill yourself. You know, you, you, you're riding like a lunatic. And within a few months, he'd killed himself. He'd, he'd hit another motorbike coming the other way God. on the same thing. And, and ironically, you know, he did. And here I am, like you say, since 1956, still on the planet, even having yeah. had this kind of lifestyle. Well, it sounds like a miracle that you are still alive, Keith, to be honest, from your, your childhood exploits. But you, you certainly had an affinity with two wheels. When did things start to move on? You thought, actually, there's a career in this for me or, you know, I could take this seriously and actually start putting, uh, putting the bikes on the track and racing. My mum's brother was uh, a speedway rider back in the day. Quite a good middle order speedway rider. Uh, at one time, he looked like he could have been sort of somewhere up there world championship wise. But Alan, his name was Alan Cowland, for anybody that's really interested, you look him up. Um, he rode for various clubs. Like I say, a job in speedway rider, that's how he earned his living. Um, he moved up to Northamptonshire, believe it or not. And my mum and dad followed him with me um, when I was about just about 15 years old. I had a last year at school here because I was the youngest in my year. So it meant that I left school at 15. But so Alan was a speedway rider. I followed him around the country. We, we had great times. You know, it was fantastic. He was he was a bit of a hero of mine, sadly. And for those of you that feel this way, you, you can look up support, of course. He uh, took his own life um, mm. later on in life, which was a, a, a big disaster from a family point of view, obviously, for us. Um, and sadly, I mean, following on that theme, you know, had any of us suspected or known or considered or thought or, or made the effort to just take a little bit more notice, we could have 
you know, save the bloke to be yeah. frank with you. So anybody that's in a similar position, that's, that's got a friend or a family member that might be, um, in similar straits and you were only a guess it was only a nuance he just turned up once or twice too often at my house feeling a bit miserable when i never paid enough attention to it and so dunk, i beat myself up for that one but he yeah. was the inspiration for me to go uh professional racing purely and simply because um you can't be a hooligan you've got to be a professional i turned midstream if you like around the age of sort of 14 15 um, to thinking that this could be a career, but I had to wait because we had no money. You know, my family didn't have money at all. So it was something, you know, my mum and dad, basically they, they did the best they could for us, which was provide a roof and food and didn't yeah. charge me board. Don't forget back in the day, you paid your parents to live in your parents' house. You know, that yeah, was how yeah. it was done. I mean, we all bitch and whinge about things nowadays, the way that we have to live as, as kids, but but back then, you you had to you pay your way, which restricted what you could do um, in a sports field, if you like. So uh, that that was, and, and I wasn't alone. There were many many motorbike races. I think, yeah, you know, the difference between car racing and bike racing is, is is financial, particularly when you're a youngster. I mean, a lot of the the car racing model was always that you took money to the team or you took money into the sport. In our game, we could only take money out of it because we didn't have any to put in it. Um, and that's that's basically where it all began. How, how does one at that era, during that time, at your age, go from you know paying your way to put a roof over your head to actually getting on the track for the first time? It was uh, friends, effectively. I had two friends locally that I met through other friends um, that were embarking on club racing, which would have been Bill Langley and Steve Trassler. Steve Trassler I'm still in touch with. Bill Langley moved to America. Sadly, he's gone now, so... Uh, we we don't connect obviously because uh, he's elsewhere but um they both had a van and i bought a second hand production 500 cc crook suzuki um from a bloke in luton and off i t- trundled to a to a practice day we don't we didn't have track days in those days where you could turn up and run what you brung we had the occasional practice day that was on a Wednesday or wherever it was and it was Cadwell park i went to Cadwell park for the first time with those two guys had a buzz around again it's funny how you realize you're fast. You don't know mm. why, um, but you're running with all the, the so-called guys that have got all the kit and you've got no kit at all. I've got a pair of black leathers on that I bought for 15 quid that were too big for me that I had to wear my clothes under just to fill them out. In fact, I remember I sold them back. I sold them back to the same. It's disgusting now. I think of it. I sold them back to the same bloke I bought them off. It'd be like wearing someone else's underpants. <laughs> you know, it's just the worst thing in the world. Um, but anyway, that was how it started. So Cadwell Park on a 500cc Crook Suzuki, I knew I was quick, um, because all the guys with all the gear were behind me. Yeah. Um, but, and, but do and you, that's, that's okay, really this is, this is going to sound really naive from, so obviously I'm a, I'm more of a car person than a bike person. Um, and I've had limited experience with bikes. I took my CBT years ago, so I've, I, I, I understand the feeling of it. But at that point in your life, you're, you're turning up at a track, you're going past these guys. How do you know what to do in the sense of like, you know, taking the apex or, you know, taking the right line and, and learning that craft? Or was it like stuff you'd seen in, in the media or, or watching it? How did you know what you there, were doing? There was no media. It's a printed media then. Yeah. You didn't get it on TV. There was nothing on TV. There's nothing you could look at. You couldn't review a video like most Grand Prix riders do nowadays. They look at other people riding, see if there's anything you can pick up on. Having said that, what you've got to bear in mind, back then it was an inaccurate art. It isn't like it is now. Everybody from club racing, track days forward, are more professional than it was back in that time. Yeah, I knew I was fast because I could pass people. How did I learn tracks? I remember a friend of mine, Mick Hemmings, uh, Mick Hemmings Motorcycles. Um, he's been a friend of mine for donkey's years. Sadly, he's not with us anymore either. That's what happens when you reach a certain age. Yeah. Um, uh, but Mick always used to ask me, what gear are you in at Park Corner at Cadwell Park? And I'd go, I don't know. It was all instinctive. Everything yeah. was just, it just came completely naturally. I the, probably one of the very few regrets I have because I don't think you can look back over eras and 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 regret the way you did it because that was the best way you could do it at the time. Yep. Um, was that if I was born in a different era, 
I feel that my talent, and this goes for, for many of my contemporaries at the time, I feel that my talent could have been stretched much further. Right. You know, I finished sixth in the, in, in the 350, which is the equivalent of Moto2 uh, World Championship. In a year, I only did half the rounds. Uh, I finished second at the British Grand Prix at Silverstone on a motorbike that we built in the shed um, yeah. over factory bikes, factory Kawasaki's, you know, factory Yamahas and all the rest of it. Back in the day, you could do that. Now, if you had the right management and the right training um, and the right uh, people around you back in the day, there were a lot of British guys that were, you know, same as me and, and could have gone a lot further. But we didn't yeah. have all of that in those days. It was an amateur sport, very much an amateur sport, and it's come on leaps and bounds. Thank heavens for that. Um, yeah. And we are where we are now. But I don't regret any of it. Bloody good fun from day yeah. one. That's the other yeah. thing. We probably have much more fun than they have now. Well, it's such a serious business now, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit, you know, it's not dissimilar to Formula One in the sense that the technology of the bikes is so high now. Um, you know, the aerodynamics on them is insane. The tyres and everything. You, you mentioned there about, you know, stretching your talent a little bit more. If you could have picked yourself up when, you know, you were, say, 18 years old and popped you in today's British Superbikes or MotoGP or Moto2, how do you think you'd get on? I, I have some inkling you know, like the, there were, I never had factory bikes that were, you know, a factory bike in my era was 20 or 30 mile an hour faster than the bikes that we, you could buy over the counter like we did um, in MotoGP or the equivalent, which was 500cc Grand Prix back then. Don't forget, we were on two strokes then, they're on four strokes now. Lots has changed regarding the technology. I think that if I could say anything about my own talent, I was really good at setup really good at the nitty gritty details the reason we could get the most out of the types of motorcycle that i was riding at the time even with whatever talent i had was because we always they were push starts back in the day believe it or not we never had clutch starts we didn't have launch control and all the rest of it like you got now but i could go from qualifying on the third row of the grid to leading a grand prix i did it several times into the first few corners because i managed to get my bike carburating <laughs> Now, there's a word you won't hear often nowadays. <laughs> so perfectly that it would start with one lean, one leg lean on the motorbike and it would fire so I could be through. And what I'm saying here is, is that technically I was quite astute in making the gearing right, making the, 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 the nitty gritty of the motorbike. It was just a tad better than everyone else could manage. Convert that to today, and it's the only way that I can, I think we would have done quite well because I was analytical. I was one of the early guys that was analytical about motorbikes and about the setup and about what you had to do to achieve it. What we didn't have was any of the kind of backup, you know, nutrition, dehydration. What the hell's dehydration? That probably was something that you had after you'd had a few pints the night before, before you went racing. And you literally did have a few pints the night before. Yeah. And you also smoked. I was a 40 yeah. a day man between 15 and 28. Um, I gave up completely in 28 and I've never smoked a cigarette or anything since. Um, so it's kind of one of those situations where you're learning, you're learning through your own experience. Arm pump. I had arm pump all the time. You remember, you know, the, the carpal tunnel, the, the, the muscle yeah, inside yeah. the carpal tunnel sheath swells to such a point that you lose the feeling in your hands all the time. So what did I do to deal with that? I used to have one of them great big ball clips and all day long, I would be walking around with one in each hand and all you're doing is making it worse because yeah. we had no knowledge about these things back then. So, you know, the, the, the it was an amateur sport back in the day. It's come on a long way since then, and uh, it's the better place for it. And, I, and but, I must say that I don't believe in the good old days. Yeah. That phrase just cheeses me off. And, you know, the fact is we are in the good old days right now. I mean, there has never been – it's never been more competitive – in Moto3, Moto2, Moto GP, the three massive classes. Back in my day, you had 80cc, 125cc, 250cc, 350cc, and 500cc as the premier class in Grand Prix. Um, but it was never as good as it is now. Yeah, yeah, you had some that were perhaps top three or four, maybe. But now, you've know, got the whole grid within a second um, across all the classes. It's just fantastic Grand Prix racing now. So I'm yeah, never going to be someone that looks back and says, they were the yeah, days, back know. in my day. Yeah, no, but yeah. it's it's an interesting thing to make that comparison though, because I, I listened to a a podcast recently with Michael Owen, the footballer, and he was saying that, um, and I think it was it might have been Shearer or someone who said a similar thing that 
the players now in football in Premier League football now they're finely tuned athletes but if you're seriously quick if you're fast and you can kick a ball a bit you can probably get to the Premier League so the actual talent and intricacies of playing football was better back in the you know 80s 90s or whatever do, do you think the talent pool across the different championships is strong is there strength in depth or is there like an elite who are just super amazing and then there's a few also rounds uh, there have been some super elites. We call them aliens. It's something that it's been, it seems to be a motorcycle thing where we call them aliens, where they seem to do something that no other motorcycle racer has ever seen before. That, that's what we class as an alien, where, where the creme de la creme are looking at a guy and thinking, how's he just done that? Uh, you know, there are such people. Casey Stoner is my, particularly my favourite, the Australian that, that yeah. did everything at such a young age. Um, Freddie Spencer was the first alien I'd ever seen in my life. He won the 250 and 500cc Grand Prix championships in one year. Um, so that would be like running, in your case, GP2 and, and, and Formula One on the same weekend and winning both championships. You know, it's, yeah. it's an unheard of feat and it's never been done since. Um, since Freddie Spencer, that is. Um, no, the pool is bigger now than it's ever been. Uh, it's the biggest, the, the, the ladder to MotoGP is tight. The rungs are tight all the way through. Um, where we're lacking are females. Um, mm -hmm. We have had a, our first female world champion um, in, a, in a lower end world championship class. But at the end of the day, and the only reason we don't have females that are there, because the wonderful thing about motorsport, I believe, is that there is no bar to, to gender at all in that, you know the physique and the and the and the thinking and all the rest of it. Women are are absolutely our equal, if not in some respects better than us. <laughs> May I venture? And the, the point being is is that the only reason we don't have females at the top end of the sport more often is because the pool's small. You know, there's, yeah. we're, we're dipping in a very small pool. There's very few females that are encouraged. And I think that, that goes right back to schools. I, you know, schools annoy me. I mean, we, they're only just catching on that things aren't pink for one half of the the school and blue for the other half you know they haven't quite got it worked out you know one lot don't have dolls and the other lot have have motorbikes to push around it, it's kind of the encouragement is only just in very recent times are we equalizing the the situation in in, in education as well yeah. um i've got four girls so you can imagine the the dinner table cons you know conversations if old dad um disappears back into the uh the, the way of an older fellow um, you soon get straightened out in my house, that's for sure. I'm sure it sounds like it. But it, does it, is the reason, I mean, it's a complicated subject, I suppose, but in Formula One, what, if you look at what they're trying to do with F1 Academy and before that um, W Series um, and, you know, teams really investing in diversity and then going down into karting, I suppose the pool is bigger in four-wheel racing because you can safely or relatively safely go karting at six years old it probably is a little bit more challenging to get on a motorbike or a small motorbike at six years old so the the the, the, the talent pool i suppose from a young age is smaller but is there an argument to say that motorbike racing should be looking at some sort of all all women racing championship to try and get more more bums into the seats well we just have literally this year tim uh, it, it's it's a new thing that, that it's, it's strange when you talk to a friend of mine jenny timmouth who, who I've, I've done a few broadcasts with and i think we've we've done on on our partner podcast omg podcast we've had jenny timmouth on before she is a stunt rider for in the mission impossible uh, franchise with tom cruise and the like she's fastest woman on a superbike in this country in the uk um She's she's quick, yeah. Against all people, she very humble lady. I I just love her manner. Um, but she's not against a, a single series, but she wants to compete against everybody. And I think yeah. the, the 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 problem we have is if you make these single series, there's a ceiling. They're as good as they are within that group, and yeah. there's not the stretch to to yeah. If it's gonna if it's gonna promote females into a, a situation where they can then move on into to bigger classes better classes faster classes um then that's great but my feeling is is that that these one make series these series that you see they they, they have a ceiling to them and and they don't move on from there and i, I think you know winning a, a woman's championship you know 
I, I, I just don't think motorsport needs that. Um, yeah. It may do from a financial point of view and from a sponsorship point of view. That's a different argument. But from a sporting point of view, I think that, that women are well capable of, of sticking it to the boys. There is a, 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 a case of a transgender. I mean, Mike Duff, who was a 350 uh, Yamaha, I think it was, rider, factory rider, who was massively fast, you know, at Grand Prix level, um, obviously did the transition. Um, and it's got a book from way back. You know, Mike Duff is now Michelle Duff. And I did an interview with him a long time ago on, on um, I think it was UTV in Northern Ireland. And the, the, the whole concept of, of motorcycle racing, there's no bar. Anybody can join in. It's, it is one of the most diverse and possibly diverse for anybody that wants to be uh, involved in it. And I, I think that's that's great from a sporting value. There isn't anything like you, the, the physique you might have in for swimmers, for instance, or athletes, for instance. Yeah. This transgender thing is a major problem from from that point of view. You know, who has an advantage, who doesn't have an advantage. Um, but in motorsport, nobody has an advantage. We are yeah. all equal, quite naturally. We are all equal. That, but it's that, funny because we we, uh, we had we interviewed um, Charlie Martin on this show um, a little while ago, maybe eighteen months ago or so, and Charlie, who. Uh, was a man is now a woman went through the change did it fully had uh, all her uh, testosterone removed estrogen put in um, you know fully uh, sh she's a woman and um, she said that she's a better and more well-rounded racing driver now as a woman with less testosterone and you know um, aggressive traits that sometimes men may have and she's a smoother more calculated and quicker driver um, but it was interesting that um, she wasn't allowed into the W series um, because of her transgender, transgender nature. So that, that she was, I think there was talk of her going in and it, it just, it never transpired. And W series was, was always criticized because of the exact same reason that you have highlighted that it became a destination, not part of a journey onto something else. And I don't know how you get around that apart from, you know, there's more than equal, which is cropped <laughs> up with Kate Bevan and, and Coulthard and all that trying to find a, a woman world champion. Well, I think, I, I think what you do is, and, and, and pardon this, you've got to have the balls to do something. You know, you've got to actually get hold of it and say, no, this is the way it should be. It's it, it should be our controlling bodies who, who, who look after these things and make sure that it, you know, we yeah. do not have the same situations that other sports have when it comes to transgender. Um, we don't have that, that problem, if you like. Um, but there again, it's a small part of the sport. But I, again, the, the the point I'm trying to make is is motorsport, motorcycle sport, is an equality. It is yep. it is an an equal opportunity um, sport, whereas other sports perhaps have that bar just purely because it's a physical thing. Whereas for us, you know, you can go from Danny Pedrosa, who's five foot two and and fifty kilos, to yeah. Uh, Petrucci, who's who's probably getting on for eighty five kilos, I would think. Um, you know, there's a massive difference in strength, height, you know, everything regarding motorcycles. Um, you know, we do have weight limits that obviously try and equal some of that out a little bit. But, but I think that that there is, there is no bar for a woman, and um, yeah. and uh, you know, may it um, get itself sorted out, and we have a few more in it. I suspect the, the biggest bar in any motorsport situation is money. Yes. Yeah. And is it on that actually commercially, the, the commercial side of the sport, what sort of health is that in? Cause you know, you look at, I, I draw the comparisons of formula one and the, the, the money in formula one is just absurd. In fact, in motorsport, the four wheel motorsport up and down the ladders, you know, you could do You could do a, a competitive year in karting for 150,000 pounds. You know, it's absurd. The, the, the money that parents are forking out just to get into karting with no guarantee of it going anywhere. What's it like in, in superbikes, is it is it similar? Is it um, are the numbers ridiculous when you get to the upper echelons? Yeah, they are ridiculous. You do need to, you need the backing at the end of the day, and unfortunately, particularly in the UK, um, you know the 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 graph starts at a much older age than it does, say in Spain or Italy, where the weather is nicer, kids are on motorbikes earlier in their lives. You know, there's a, there's a bit bigger infrastructure. It's funny, I, Stuart Pringle, managing director at Silverstone, I had a long conversation with him when they're building this new kart track that's going to be an international standard and, and so on and so forth in the middle of Silverstone. Um, we had a conversation, you know, I did a, a BBC Sounds podcast, BBC Bikes podcast on uh, some time ago with, with Stuart. 
and we were talking about this new track that they're building and i said so you're going to be running you know mini bikes you're going to be running you know the pocket rockets that they do in you run the series that they run in italy in spain and so on and so forth he said you could see he hadn't really thought about or rather the yeah. consortium hadn't really thought about it and then he said yeah I, you know because we need that we need that kind of ladder and and as it turns out no they're not because they're all worried about scarring the 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 tarmac for the for the cart kids and the, and the the the, mm. the up and coming car guys there is no doubt the pecking order is very much car orientated in this country jonathan palmer you know a teammate of mine believe it or not him in formula one me in moto gp or the the equivalent which was 500 grand prix back in the day jp and then jp we were both sponsored by a, a building firm in bedford sdc builders back in the day and jp and i used to have to do the the occasional you know meet and greets handshake things for sdc occasionally and he now with he's the the, the uh biggest shareholder in msvr and owns yeah all the major tracks and the leasehold now on Donington Park as well. So he's got all the major tracks in the UK. You know, I often ask, are you doing enough regarding the ladder? He's got a fantastic um, series director in the, a fellow called Stuart Higgs, who, who is embedded in motorbikes and, and he's a real sharp lad. He knows his stuff. But even with that, you know, you wonder whether the ladder is moving us forward far enough and fast enough uh, into the higher echelons. We're behind the Italians. We're behind the Spanish. Um, there are other emerging markets that have come through. You never saw a Japanese rider, even though they produce the best motorbikes, you mm. never saw a Japanese rider at the, the front of the field. You do now. Now we're getting Asia Pacific riders that are coming through as well from Thailand. We've got some quick riders from Thailand, Indonesia. Um, so we're moving east rather than moving west. There's hardly anything coming out of America anymore. Australia is mm. a dead market as well, which used to be one of the the headline markets for motorcycle uh, world champions. Um, so the world is a, is a continually shifting place. And then you bring into the uh, diversification side of things as well. So it's a, it's a very exciting place. Dorna though, the people who own the, they are the promoters, they own the series, they own Motor Grand Prix, and they also own World Superbikes. They got to inherit that after they bought another load of things through, through their controlling companies. Um, they're looking to sell. You know, they're looking right. to sell. There's rumors at the moment, 3.5 billion pounds, I think it is, uh, the, the, you know, the, is the, is the ask, I think 4 billion was the asking price. You know, we're talking mega money um, for someone else to take it over. You know, has it topped out? Mm. Are we at the top of things? Don't know. Anyway, we could go on for hours. I could go yeah. on for hours when we start it's, talking about this stuff. It is a fascinating subject and it's it's interesting to consider whether whether you, we are at peak MotoGP or whether this is really just the tip of the iceberg. And I suppose it's, it's getting it out, isn't it, into the, the young people all around the world who, who might want to look at a motorbike instead of a go-kart. And, it, and that is a massive, massive undertaking, isn't it? Well, you've just, you've just hit a couple of nails on the head there. I mean, like the fact of the matter is, is that if you go to any British motorcycle race meeting, you, have, you are surrounded by flat caps and grey air. Yes. Um, which means that our demographic is far too old um, and encouraging youngsters in there. And if I might touch on the point, again, on OMG Motor GP, which is motor media production, um, we've just done a, a conversation with Brad Binder, a South African fellow who's going pretty damn good, finished fourth in the Motor GP World Championship last year. And he started in carts. You know, him and his brother right. Darren, who is also a very quick Grand Prix runner, um, started careers in carts and motocross and I, I put it to him it's, it's the idea to win the MotoGP world championship and then go to formula one because it's been mooted by the likes of you know max biaggi if you want to go back to to world champions valentino rossi has looked at. in fact there was a fantastic uh, film i think it was called the switch or something where um lewis hamilton who is a quick runner on a superbike as well by the way yeah yeah, you know, talent, eye to hand, con eye to hand, you know, coordination and the like. Lewis Hamilton, quick on a bike. Uh, Valentino Rossi, quick in a Formula One car. Talent does cross over, but it mm. hasn't done since the likes of John Surtees, perhaps. Um, yeah, effectively. yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's it's funny. I've we've spoken to so many people on this show um, who, over a certain generation, who actually started like you, tearing around, um, you know, a field or. Um, you know, some some derelict industrial estate on two wheels. I think I think it was um, Mark Blundell who was telling us that that he did the same. He started out, you know, on little scramble bikes and 
and, and eventually switched to four wheels. It just seemed the way that things were for the majority of people. But it's really interesting hearing you talk about the sport and it sounds like there is a, a real need for it to go more mainstream and, and attract that younger audience. But that, that is a huge challenge and perhaps it needs Dorna to sell up and someone else, you know, like a Liberty Media or someone to come in and change the landscape. Or perhaps it needs to go more digital like Formula One's done and drive, survive and all this and attract people to the sport. It's a, yeah, it's, well, it's the, a big, the, the, the people, subject. The people that are in the um, offing at the moment are connected to Liberty Media. So right. um, the Fox Warner, Liberty Media type thing. So the, the Americans are coming and they've got a chief commercial officer now for Dorna is an American, Dan Rosamondo, who yes, was originally with the, the NBA, I think, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, so there are some fairly f formidable people that are looking at, at how this all um, progresses from, from now on inwards. Watch this very space. Interesting. It's yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. But um, Keith, effectively, it's not as popular as yeah. cars. That's, that's where we're at. I mean, Formula One is yeah. still, you know, from a commercial point of view, it's it's top dollar um yeah motor gp motor gp as a sport is more exciting um formula one as an enterprise is more profitable <laughs> well i mean i think bowls is more exciting than formula one at the at moment, the moment uh, you're right yeah it needs uh we need something good to happen um at the race this weekend in Jeddah. um now keith we've kept you for long enough and um, we have a final three questions which we ask all of our guests and uh, it throws up a myriad of different answers first one for you What's got you excited at the moment and doesn't have to be motorsport related? Do you know what? I live a life of excitement, even though life is a little slower at the minute. I'm not on the roundabout. I'm not running around the world um, at MotoGP races anymore. Um, it's family. I mean, it's quite boring. Um, I have to say that, that my, my range of children is from 35 to nine years old. So I, I kind of, have a, I don't get any rest around here. Um, and, the excitement is seeing them move forward now. Well, you know, one of my daughters has just started at Anglia Ruskin. She's on mechanical engineering. So, um, right. you know, we've, we've, we've got, I, I don't want to be a parent who lives my life, you know, through my children. I think there's, there's too much of that. I've, I have got my own life. Um, travel is something that excites me all of the time. I could be on an airplane for hours. In fact, I remember getting off an airplane when I got to Australia once and the, the, uh, lady at the door she said um oh long flight are you are you glad it's over something along those lines i said no i could go back yeah. <laughs> it's the only time i get to read a book or watch the movies yeah. i want to do or or write anything because it's the only time you get any peace for sort of 12 yeah. 14 20 hours um because there's no time in our lives tim where we get any peace it's so true. It's so true. I mean, it's 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 either on a plane. Uh, we we got a dog uh, last year who's now one, and that's the only thing that's got me away from just the chaos of normal life. It's great. And I listen to a podcast or you know just enjoy the countryside and the quiet. It's very rare <laughs> that you actually are just on your own. You know, no phone. No, just take yourself away. Well, nowadays you can shut the door now. I mean, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> you can shut yeah. the door. <laughs> yeah, Heaven. as long as you pay. Yeah, well, exactly. Um, what's one lesson you have learned through your work and your career that you think everyone should learn at some point in their life? Listen to others. Arrogance. I'm, I'm not against arrogance. I think arrogance is, is in sportsmen or in business. You need to have a ten, a, 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 an amount of belief in yourself and the way that you're going about something to make it work. So arrogance is not quite the the terrible thing that i think that um people make it out to be um, a degree of arrogance is necessary in my view but so is being able to take on board the smart people that i know have taken on board how other people have done something what other people are saying canvassing that opinion to try and work the best strategy out yeah. you know somebody said to me ages ago it's much better to learn from other people's mistakes than from your own um, sadly, if you're pushing the boundaries, you're always going to learn from your own mistakes. Um, the unfortunate downside to what I've just said is that with social media being what it is, some of them bullets get through. You know, mm -hmm. somebody's probably watching this at the moment, disagrees with what we say, and from a keyboard in, in Timbuktu, is going to give me some stick, you some stick, or whatever. I mean, we're old enough to be able to fence that a little bit, but I think sometimes youngsters on social media really take the odd bullet to heart um 
even though the silent majority are the ones that probably are the ones that we ought to be listening to but can't because they are silent, it's that those one or two people, and sometimes then bullets get through and sting a bit. Um, yeah. So my guidance would always be, you know, if, if you get to that point, turn social media off for a little while. And this goes from a personal point of view outside of sport. If it's getting to you, turn it off for a while. Take a break yeah. out of it. Enjoy what Tim's just said. Take the dog for a walk. Just take a bit of time out, bit of time on your own and work it out from there. But for me, um, I wish I'd done more listening. What does somebody say? You've got two ears and one mouth. That means use these twice as much as this. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Sound advice. Final one for you, Keith, and we'll let you get on with your day. What are you scared of? Ah, uh, that's changed as I've got older. I was scared of nothing. Absolutely nothing. There was nothing that scared me at all. Um, I've been unfortunate to have witnessed people die. I've been unfortunate to have witnessed massive accidents. And without trying to make out that I'm some kind of hard guy, I'm not. Um, I just had a place to put that. And then it all comes back when you get older. Suddenly that side of things, you, re you realize how fragile you are as a human being. Um, and those losses that I've suffered over the years, and there have been many, many of them from friends and family and the like, um, they start to hit you in the face. I think 50 years old and onwards, you really start to notice it. And then you start to see that that fragility um, and you worry about, in my case, my children, particularly, that's the first and foremost thing you worry about your children. Mm. Um, and for me, that's still my biggest fear is, is, is anything untoward happening to my family. You know, yeah. I've done my life. I've had a great life. If it was tomorrow, I fell off my perch. That's good enough for me. I've made sure that I'm insured well enough. So all of my lot are doing pretty well. Business is okay. Um, so I'm, I'm okay, but all of my family, including my wife, are, are, are much younger than I am. And so therefore, you know, I worry about them. I worry. Uh, one of the things, Tim, that I, I'm, I amaze myself at is I can see things happening. I can understand stuff miles away from when it's going to happen. I can predict what's going to happen in the, in one of my children's strategies, one of my, whatever it might be, I can see it happening through my age and the wisdom that that brings. I can see stuff. I can predict yeah. what somebody's strategy in my house is going to turn out like where their mistakes are. They can't. And sometimes I said to them the other day at dinner, I said, I'm sorry, I get grumpy about it. And I forget that you're only 19 years old, 20 years old as two of them are. Um, I forget that you haven't had the experience to understand the mistake you're making. So take my advice, listen to what other people have to say. Yeah. And disseminate yeah, absolutely. that. Absolutely. So that's yeah. my fear. Family always, always, always going to be for all of us, I would imagine. Very good. Well, Keith, thank you so much for joining us. It's fascinating to hear about um, your journey through um, motorbikes, MotoGP, superbikes, and, and your thoughts on the, the current state of play in the sport. Um, and some really good advice there for people, which um, I'm sure will be appreciated. Um, we didn't even touch on the OMG Moto GP podcast. So if you've not had a listen to that yet, go and give it a listen. Um, Keith hosts that with all sorts of interesting guests. And there's down the pub as well, isn't there, that you do with uh, some, some famous names in the boozer. It's the only way to go. Down the pub. Um, it's, it's very lucky. It's a friend of mine, a fellow called Chris Herring, who owns the pub. Um, and uh, we, we get together with some, some motorcycle personalities and now OMG MotoGP podcast, uh, we put it out. It's on YouTube as well, so you can, you can actually see us as well as hear us. Um, but it's across all the platforms. Motor Media produced the thing. And uh, thank you very much, Tim, for that. Pleasure. And uh, thanks for coming on the show, Keith. I will see you soon.